We are live today at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center in Oregon City. We're checking out the heritage that makes Oregon so special. A lot of you probably grew up playing the Oregon Trail game. I know I did. Out there hunting or, you know, breaking my arm, dying of dysentery or something on the Oregon Trail. But the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center really brings that story to life far more than that Apple IIe we had in our elementary school could ever teach us. I'm joined here by Gail. She runs everything here. And this is more than just a museum. I mean, explain yeah. the difference between a museum and an interpretive center for people like me who didn't get the difference. Right. We have artifacts and props because we encourage everyone to handle things, to um, do things, activities. We want the experience of being on the trail. And you know, she's talking about hands-on stuff. I mean, check it out. This isn't what I wear every day, uh, not hats like this. Although I may start, it's actually kind of comfy. You've got all kinds of stuff, kids or adults who act like kids, like I do, can yeah. you know, dress up in period costume and really kind of just immerse themselves in what the lifestyle was like back in pioneer times. Right. So we start out at the beginning of the journey. So you can pack the wagon, you can play school in the schoolhouse. It's all about before they left, why they left. We have tablets with information. There's lots of things to read, but there's also lots of things to do. Candle dipping and butter making are done in the Henderson farm. And we're gonna do that later, so stay tuned for that. Yeah. So as you move through, there's things for um, the seniors, the adults, all ages, because people travel as families. So we wanna keep everyone educated, entertained, and so we have a variety of things. And in wagon three, at the end of the journey, we focus there on the genealogy. So we have we're self-guided and also we have interpreters here to answer questions and then to offer genealogy um, information as well. One of the really cool things is, is, she said, you know, in Wagon 3, the way that it's set up here, as you come on from the street, you'll notice that it's actually set up as three massive wagons, even have the arch that you would see on the covered wagons that the pioneers came. It's a really, you know, impressive structure. But, you know, it's more than just, you know, the history stuff here. You guys are actually a state visitor center as well. Yes. yes. So we have knowledgeable staff that once you... So, the immigrants landed here, the pioneers, and then that was the beginning of their living at the Promised Land. So Wagon 3, they claim their land. Then, in modern day times right now, we're a visitor center. So what we do is we, after they claim their land here, we send them on to other sites in Oregon City, Clackamas County, the state, and then also because we're tied to the sites along the trail um, nationally, so in Nebraska and Missouri. So we also have information and maps for that as well. And this facility actually sits on the exact spot where people ended their journey. We sit on Abernathy Green. Yes. And so when people had spent six months walking across the country, well, halfway across the country, I guess, and they spent, you know, the muscle long journey to get here, this is actually where they ended and said, all right, we're here, now where do we go? So, I mean, right. there's a, a lot of history right here in this very spot. Yes, yes, it's all about George Abernathy here, because George Abernathy had his store and he let people camp here. Uh, free until they got their land and of course they bought the provisions from him. And one of the really cool things also is just I mean the way you immerse everybody into it I mean we've got the docents in period dress and we'll be speaking with one of them shortly but apparently everybody's having a good time because you guys just got an award from TripAdvisor correct? Yes yes it was an ex um, a certificate of excellence for the staff they it's not always what happens, it's how you deal with it. And our staff are very caring and very knowledgeable. And well, I'm, yes, I'm very proud of them. Well, you should be. I mean, yeah. and the way they deal with the larger groups, like you, we actually scheduled this a little later than we wanted to today because you had, what, two really large groups of right. school kids coming in. Right, I think right around 75 for one group and right around 29 for another. And That's thanks hurting for cats. staff, thanks for staff. We can do two groups now and they're happy but everybody's happy the staff and the students and the teachers so that's good we're also developing an Oregon trail experience and a nature trail in the back side of the wagon so we do one of the groups today took advantage of that by um, having the westward adventure so it's all outside and that represents the whole trail and that's also they they set up camp they start out with packing the wagon but it's very 
it's meant to be an experience where you can get a little more of a feel of being a pioneer walking that 2,000 miles. Because that's something, actually, a misconception a lot of people have is, you know, as we see one of the wagons that, you know, people may have, like, ridden across, but they didn't ride in the wagon. The wagon was for stuff. Right. Everybody they walked. walked. They literally walked the entire way here. Yeah. And that, I mean, to me, is just mind-boggling. I walk down to the mailbox and I get winded. So yeah. I, I don't know how they did it across the country, especially with those wonderful shoes they had back then. And that's our job. We want to try to, you know, make people feel like the... the did. Well, you know, and, and the next time, you know, if you've got kids who are whining about being bored or anything like that, bring them here. Let them get immersed because they have a good time, but it is also impossible for a kid not to come away with an appreciation for everything that they have now. Yes, yes, and they, they really do get involved and they ask really good questions. The children are just, they can do journal writing, there's... Um, candle dipping, butter making, of course, the dress up, but then we also have other crafts too that um, Bethany will tell me more about. Well, let's bring Bethany over. I thought I heard you standing back yeah. there. Bethany is one of those who said we, we bring people in there, you know, the docents are dressed in costume and it really helps again immerse you into that experience. She doesn't just wear this for the fashion or the comfort. <laughs> it's actually just part of the whole, you know, history, you know, bringing it to life here. But first thing we want to do is let's talk about the wagon. So let's move over into this room here if we can. And let's talk about the wagon because as, as people may or may not know, the pioneers had to pack their entire life into this wagon. Everything. Um, or nothing is maybe. They may either, you know, they have to figure out what they're going to bring. And this is all the space they had to put their stuff into. This little bitty area here. So as you can imagine, they had to make a lot of difficult choices of what to take and what to leave behind. That, you know, exact, couldn't exactly have been very easy for a lot of families, especially when we're at a time when perhaps the wives didn't have as much say so on whether or not they wanted to come, but they were coming anyway. You know, and they might have been able to talk their men into bringing along their wedding present china set or something like that. But you know what? Lower times than not, they would have to toss that out of the wagon halfway across the plains if they figured out, hey, well, we're not going fast enough. Um, because it takes six months to do this whole trip. We're going one or two miles an hour. So that is as fast as those uh, sturdy oxen can pull this 2,000 pound wagon. Um, so it takes six whole months. So we have to make sure we get here before winter because you do not want to be going around Mount Hood in November. No, and then the other thing is you had to time their journey to coincide with when things were blooming so the oxen could actually eat. Because again, you're not carrying ox food in this on the no, way there. No, you are not. But that's what the other reason we use oxen because they are not picky eaters. They'll eat the grass. They'll even eat your clothes if you leave them out to dry on a bush, which a lot of people complained about. They weren't the most pleased about that. Sounds but. like a big goat. Yes. <laughs> so, kind of explain how this whole, uh, I, I don't want to call it the, you know, exhibit, because it's more, this is hands-on activity. Explain how this works. Um, so, especially when we have groups, we bring them in and we point out how little space there is. You can't even fit everything in a normal kid's room in this box. And this is what you're sharing with your entire family. And the families were much larger back then. You typically had six or seven or eight brothers and sisters. Wow. Um, then we bring them over here, and we've got these handy dandy little um, worksheets that they get to fill out and do practice all that math skills that we know they love. Um, so there's all different items they would have thought about packing, whether it's a bag of flour, like some of these look like, or a coffee grinder, which some of the kids do not think is the most important. But it actually is. Coffee just wait till they're just wait till they become parents. They'll know how important the coffee is. Even more than that, caffeine. If you boil the water, you will not die of cholera and get any of those waterborne diseases. So packing. That's why I kept dying of the dysentery on the Oregon Trail. Got to have more coffee. That was it. Um, so you they can choose all those things they would have brought. Um, do they want to try to bring some toys or a piano? Hopefully not. They're smarter than that. Um, <laughs> Who brought a piano? <laughs> someone brought a cannon. And she wanted to celebrate Independence Day by shooting a cannon, but that lucky lady must have had more than one wagon because that would not all fit in here. So once they've thought about it and we tell them, uh, we talk about what sorts of decisions were wise or not. Remember the wagons are not refrigerated, so any food you bring has to be something that is preserved, that won't go bad. Um, they mostly lived off of bacon because bacon has so much fat it will not go bad over the six months. I knew I liked these pioneers. Mm -hmm. Bacon, that's bacon good. That's good. and biscuits. So much you would probably get sick of it. But I don't think that's possible. <laughs> well, good. This is for you then. And then we can come on over here and start loading the wagon. So 
there you go. Oh, okay, so, so each one of these counts as, as How about what? a 50 pound bag? Oh, wow, 50 pounds, I'm stronger than I thought. Some of them are not actually 50 pounds. Okay. So there you go. So I see this is labeled flour, but each one of these is supposed to recommend, or just, you know, represent how much you can actually fit the wagon weight-wise? Yeah, so okay. we'll even go through the, there were a lot of the pioneers didn't know what to pack themselves. Um, so they depended on guidebooks that were written by the fur trappers that had actually been out in this area. Um, so we will load up what this guidebook, these are amounts that um, Captain Randolph Marcy suggested you should bring. Um, and so he's got 10 pounds of salt, 200 pounds of flour. And these are provisions for one adult on That's the Mormon Trail. Yes. Wow. So we fill that wagon up with this amount, and it's about a quarter full. And then we tell them that was just for one adult person, and that's not even counting all your furniture or the tools you'll need to work that land that you're going to get when you come to Oregon, because um, the land does not have anything on it. So if you're going to plant crops or build a house, you need to have those tools. Um, you probably spent your whole family savings just buying the wagon and loading it up, so you're not going to have money to buy more supplies once you arrive. And that's why you had to recover here on this land that we're on now. And this is all without having any like practice with Tetris growing up. So at least I had that benefit going for me. But so I mean, families make a lot of decisions. You know, they take what do they take? And now once they head off from the trail, what do they experience out there? Oh, it would be nothing like um, anything they had experienced before. Most people did not travel very much in those days. 1843 to about 69 is what we're talking about. Um, so if you were born on a farm in Iowa, that would probably be the only corner of the world you would see, unless you decide to take this awesome journey. Um, and for the adventure of it was one of the main reasons that people came out, to see the Rocky Mountains, the Pacific Ocean, uh, Buffalo, there were tens of thousands of those out there. Um, and these are all really spectacular things you couldn't have imagined. Not everyone liked it. Some people thought the scenery made it well worth it. Um, other people wrote in their journals that they awoke in the morning because they would sleep under the wagons if it was raining, is all they had. So he, one man complained in his journal that he awoke with the sensation of what an inebriate would feel after a week-long spree. So he said he felt like camping made him feel hungover. <laughs> That's a really nice way of saying he felt like a drunk. They were a little bit more eloquent back then in their writings. How many people came across on the Oregon Trail? So the, it's hard to estimate because we're not all sure where they all came out, um, but about 300,000 um, people were coming not just to Oregon for that free land that they could get here. Also, gold was discovered in California, so some people went south. Some people were going to Salt Lake for their religious freedom with Mormon pioneers. Um, the Santa Fe Trail was also in use at this time. So people were coming everywhere, 300,000 people. And that is the reason why Oregon is part of the United States and not Canada. Um, because they were here, for, the British Empire was here before we were. They had their claim. But once we got enough Americans out here, they had to admit that they would have to move the border up to where it is today. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the um, other fun activities that we have here, let's kind of make our way over there, is the candle making. And this is actually a favorite with the kids, isn't it? Definitely. Um, so what, we're going to walk over there and we're going to drew this without making Molly our trusty camera person tripping. And you can actually see some people over here doing the candle dipping. So let's kind of just see how this works. Because actually this is a really fascinating way to, you know, experience, you know, we just go buy a candle at the store and we're good to go. But, you know, back then, you know, they had to take it with them and if they ran out, they had to make more. So this was, you know... Especially when there's no lighting anywhere, all you got is the, the light of the stars. And there's probably a lot of work to do at night once you're done traveling, correct? Definitely, and that's why all those people had all those kids to help out with those chores. Um, so aside from setting up camp, going hunting, cooking all that food, doing the laundry, you'd be very excited to do if you only had one change of clothes and we're walking all day in the summer. Probably everybody else was excited that you're doing that too. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so there was lots to do. Um, but hopefully you were not too tired to go straight to bed and you would want to have a candle to be able to write in your journal. Uh, most of what we know about the Oregon Trail, we learned from people that kept journals. And you've got selections of these journals all throughout the, the museum, which is, you know, it gives some really amazing insight. I mean, one, again, these are people, you know, schooling was more of a luxury than you yes. know, something they had every day, but the thoughts that they put are into such just eloquent and insightful, you know, writings. And moving too, a lot of times. I mean, they really just throw the emotion into it. You, you never really expected or thought about that element, but I mean, this was just restarting your whole life in a really yeah. rough manner. 
Definitely. And it's funny that I like the journals because of how comical they are, actually. If this is your life, there's going to be funny things that are happening, hard things as well. But that's where we learn about um, the lady that packed 10 pairs of shoes and wore through all 10 of them before she got here. So we thought, she, even ladies back then loved um, having their shoes. And walking for 2,000 miles is a little tough on the soul, so I imagine that would be a little interesting. Yeah, or there was a man that um, saw a lady's ankle on the way across the trail, and that was so outrageous for those days, people were much more modest, that he fell in love with this woman, and he didn't know who she was, though. So when they got to Oregon, he had to hunt her down and find out whose ankle it had been. And he found her and married that woman. And um, that was a story that a descendant of a pioneer told us when we got out here. Um, so those stories... Maybe this is a true background for Cinderella. It wasn't yeah. the shoe and the glass slipper, it was a hint of ankle. And no. the descendant said it's lucky that she had pretty ankles because otherwise she was the ugliest woman in Oregon. <laughs> Well, you know, the angle, some people, yeah. they're all So this is things. where you get those little bits of history that aren't usually preserved in the textbooks. It's it's actual people living their actual lives. I, yeah, I didn't hear that story in social studies, yeah. definitely. So what's this device we have here? So this is the easy way to make candles, um, which most people didn't have access to. It's a mold, and you would string the wick through first, and then just pour the hot wax mm -hmm. on top, and then they're all perfectly shaped and exactly the same size. It does not usually come out that well when you can dip the candles, as we can over here. Um, they used beeswax was the best option because it smells good and it burns nice and slow so your candle lasts forever. Um, or most people don't have access to that unless you're the beekeeper himself. Um, so most people use tallow candles, which is basically um, animal fat. So everyone has a little bit left over of that from when they were cooking dinner. Um, so it's like a bacon grease candle, which does not smell as good as you think it would. I was about to say, this sounds like the next thing from Yankee Candle, bacon uh, fat. Yes. <laughs> Um, it doesn't smell very good, it makes a lot of smoke, and it's actually highly flammable, so it would be quite dangerous to, or an adventure to write a letter by that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And, well, I had a journal that I just burned up on the way here. Yeah. So, I mean, how long does it take to do the, the candle making thing? Because, I mean, it, there's actually some skill involved to do it. You know, it does not take as long as you think it would, um, because we are just, this is the little device that we use. There's a stick, there's a string that you can dip into the hot wax that we've got over here and then you dip it into the water so that it cools off so you can make a layer. So it's just little by little, layer by layer, um, but it goes pretty quickly, maybe five minutes I've been here, um, dip in and gets, well, gets you a candle about the size of your finger. And then we can detach it from that stick there and straighten it out. So if you're not perfect and don't have all the skills, um, we can smooth out some of the lumps and make it straighter um, as long as it's warm, it's flexible. So there's Martin yeah. Prayer. Well, that's good, because I have a feeling I'm going to make a lot of errors <laughs> trying this. What are some of the other, you know, day-to-day -day chores that we would have to do when, you know, oh. out on the trail? Because, I mean, it, it, it's a hard life, and, you know, there's a lot of work to do just to prepare the, prepare the food and everything. There is, yes. Um, and one of the biggest problems with preparing food on the Oregon Trail is what are you going to use to cook your meals with? On the plains, there are not a lot of sticks lying around because there's no trees. So we actually had to make our kids go out, um, little children, and collect buffalo chips, which is a polite term for buffalo poop. Um, wow. And that is what we use to cook our meals with, because it's you have to think of it as recycled grass. Um, and the dry ones are burn really nice. Um, they don't make a lot of smoke. And the kids figured out they also make pretty effective frisbees, since they didn't have room to pack any toys. So the next time your kids say they're bored, I want you to tell them that story and remind them how good they have it with their iPads and Xboxes and everything because they could be playing with Buffalo chips. Yes, hopefully just the dry ones. Yeah, hopefully just the dry ones. If it's a rainy day, you might be in trouble. Yes. <laughs> how did the families, you know, get there? Because if they've got everything packed on the, on the, the wagon, how does they get everything in and out? I mean, that seems like it'd be kind of difficult to deal with that every day. You would have to be pretty smart about how you packed it. Um, there was a provisions box that would be like the trunk of the car where you put the things you need to get to every single day. Because, um, yeah, otherwise you have to unload the whole thing. There was a lady that unloaded the whole wagon every single day because she was terrified of snakes. And she thought, she was paranoid that a snake was going to get into her wagon. Um, so she unloaded it the whole way, every single day, just to make sure to check for those snakes. Well, I bet her family loved her. But the one thing I can say is when you said it was snakes, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I agree with her. That's actually a good, <laughs> right? good thought. And spiders, watch out for those spiders. Yeah. All right, so we're going to make a candle and see just how bad my candle making skills are. Okay, so hot wax, water. Wax, water. All right, so we just dip this in here, oh, the yeah. wax, mm -hmm. and then we just go to the water. Yes. 
Now, how, I mean, how many candles would would a family have to go through, you think? I mean, is this something they would do like every week or? Um, so you definitely want to stock that before the trip. Um, whether that meant buying a dozen for a quarter from a store or if you lived in the country and making your kid do this for all week. Um, but once you made the decision to cross the Oregon Trail, you definitely spent maybe a whole year preparing for the trip, figuring out exactly how you're going to pack that and um, stocking up on tools like this. And actually, you know, come in on this, Molly, because I mean, it's, it's surprising. You, it really builds up quick. I mean, this has just been for, what, not even a minute maybe. Mm -hmm. And you can already see how much of, you know, the wax builds up every time you dip it in. And I'm getting a nice little curved candle, so that's mm -hmm. really going to work out well for sitting and writing how wonderful my journey is. Hopefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, the beeswax, I mean, how did somebody get their hands on beeswax? You know? Just go and find a hive and, oh, sweet, and let's, <laughs> let's get some... I would leave that to the bee farmer, because um, I'm not actually certain how that works either. I'm just a naive country girl myself. <laughs> um, so I would make the, the smelly bacon grease candles myself. I'm thinking that too, because I just feel bad. You know, hey, uh, Jared, uh, today's your job is to go, you know, <laughs> upset a bunch of bees and shake the hive and, and get some wax. <laughs> I, I'm guessing that was for the kid who misbehaved most on the trip. <laughs> All right, so we got a candle here. Yes. It's a little curvy, but we I think we'll go with that. Because we just slip it right off, and it's still quite warm. So there it goes. It's a bit straighter. I can even squish the bottom of it to make sure it will not fall over once you light it on fire. And now it'll stand up all by itself. All right, I just need 35 more of those for my birthday <laughs> coming up, and we're set. All right. <laughs> now, the, the best part we're going to do here is I'm, I challenged her to a butter off. Yes. Now, explain how, how this works and the importance of this element here. Okay, so making butter um, was a very commonplace chore back then. So we have here some heavy cream that we did not have to get from a cow, thank goodness. Someone else did. Um, but this is heavy cream. It's just like what you put in your coffee right now. And when we shake it, um, it will get thicker and thicker and it'll turn into whipped cream. And except for that we didn't put any sugar in it, so it's not worth it to stop and eat. Um, and if we keep on going past that state, it'll separate into the butter milk, which looks kind of like milk, and a ball of butter in the middle there. So the idea is just to shake the ever yeah. snot out of it. All right, it. pretend I'm one of those things that does the paint at Home Depot. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now, I, I am going to give a bit of a spoiler alert here, folks, is I have done this before, actually last week. Mm. And I will say this, the butter comes out so amazing and so delicious. I actually went home and did it again that night oh, yeah. with some cream that I had just for that. So I, I wish you could taste this, but I'm going to tell you this, go buy some cream, shake it for a while, shake it like a Polaroid picture, to quote the song from the early 2000s, and you're going to possibly never buy butter again, except for it gives you an arm workout as well. Yeah. Now you have a joke with this though, because mm -hmm. people have been, you know, if you've been to some of the other historical sites, heritage sites, you've tried butter churning. Yes. But the pioneers didn't churn their butter, why is that? Well, they didn't have room to pack those big old butter churns either. They, the ones they used were go up to your waist almost. Um, also, churning, as we know, is a lot of work. <laughs> Here we go. Um, even if you have that whole churn, it's too much work. We're walking an average of 18 miles a day on the Oregon Trail, so we're not going to have the time for that. People are always very inventive about coming up with ways to make their butter, to make their jobs a little bit easier. Um, and so the way that they made butter on the Oregon Trail is they would still bring the cow, and the cow would also have to walk the 2,000 miles. Um, they'd still have to milk it, but then they could just put the cream into a little bucket that had a tin bucket with a lid, and we would hang it on a hook on the wagon. And the trail was so bouncy and such a bad surface. They didn't have paved roads back then, folks, just in case you didn't realize that. <laughs> um, that it would bounce around and jostle just like this for all the time between breakfast and lunch. And then you just had to open up that bucket, and there was the butter already made for you. And so the joke that goes with this, it's a little James Bond-esque, but their butter is shaken, not churned. Yes. <laughs> so, and I don't know if it makes a difference in the flavor or anything, but it kind of, I found it kind of gives you this almost like whipped, like restaurant style butter quality. Yeah, well it depends on when you stop. So I don't want to stop because I don't want to lose. Yeah, but... <laughs> no, that's the thing. We have nothing but bragging rights on the line here. But So if you're just joining us, no, we're not, you know, trying to... Well, actually, yes, we're trying to shake the ever-loving sun out of this because we are making butter here at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. 
What are some of the other things that people would do for their daily meals? And like you said, they carry a lot of bacon, but mm -hmm. you know, what else do they do to eat? I mean, are they finding anything growing on the way to, to eat? Or um, mostly, they would be hunting for other things. Just one buffalo is quite a few meals, um, and you would have to make sure to dry the meat to preserve it. Make your own little jerky there. Um, so they would go hunting, and they would make biscuits every single day. There was a lady that complained in her journal that um, the only difference they had from eating biscuits and bacon was eating bacon and biscuits. <laughs> so that's what I mean about getting tired of it. Um, you'd be cooking all of this in a Dutch oven, much like the ones that we still get today. They're maybe not the pretty colors, but um, Dutch ovens, and you can actually bury those in the coals so it can actually function as an actual oven. Okay. And then you can stack them on top of each other as well, and the heat will go through all of it. That's where the really rich families with the nice kitchen, they've got the double oven. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Although it would be quite difficult to work over an open fire with all these skirts, as a couple of ladies finally found out the hard way. Well, that yeah, that wouldn't be good. I think I'm getting to the point of uh, whipped cream because right. it's not it's not moving that much. Yeah. Now the secret to this is when you when you feel it, you know, it, it, you don't feel much shaking going on. You got to keep going though because then all of a sudden you'll notice that you feel stuff moving around in there again, and that's when you've gotten the cream to separate into the butter and. What I'm finding is, what, the second time, you don't, oh, this has got to go away. <laughs> what I'm finding is you don't overshake it because then you compress it too much and the butter gets really hard. If you just, right when it gets to that solid point, then it gets that nice whipped consistency. And it's really, really good. Add some salt to the mix, but now this thing, we don't add salt, but I mean, the pioneers carried salt with them. Would they actually salt their butter or? Um, I don't know about that. That's a good question. Uh, we'll have to find that one out someday. <laughs> Read more journals. Yes. Well, while we're doing this, let's talk about what happens in the next building over. We'll stay over here, but yeah. after people kind of experience the beginning of the trail, mm -hmm. they're led to the second uh, wagon. What happens in there? That is where we have our feature film, Bound for Oregon. Um, and that is a movie that is entirely based off of actual pioneer diaries and journals of real people that made the trip. Um, so Dr. John McLaughlin is in the movie. Um, he's the man that was in charge of Hudson Bay Company, Fort Vancouver, and he's the one that found all these Americans that were exhausted from the journey and needed a lot and of help. shaking butter. Yes, <laughs> clearly in need of some help. Try not to do this and sound out of breath on the video. <laughs> so he um, gave them the loans and supplies they needed once they arrived to help them restart their lives here. He kind of narrates our movie. Um, and then the rest of the movie is following a couple of other notable pioneers. Um, Joel Palmer is one of the men that blazed the trail around Mount Hood, that Barlow Road that 70% of the pioneers chose to take. It was a very popular route. Now, what was their option if they didn't take the Barlow Road? Well, you could take the Columbia River was the first option originally, the only one. Um, but rivers are very dangerous for pioneers. Especially back then when there was no dams and nothing was tamed. Yes, and swimming was not a very common um, hobby. And women are wearing this. It's not a very good swimsuit. Um, but so a lot of people thought that route was too dangerous and those are the ones that came up with those other options going around Mount Hood, which has Laurel Hill on it, um, and that is what a lot of people agreed was the worst part of the trail. So you could decide to risk drowning in the river, or you could go down the steepest part of the trail, um, which was actually so steep. I got butter! There you go. <laughs> you won. <laughs> I win. Means I get to keep the butter home. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's zoom in on this. Let's bring it under the light here, actually, so you can see. Yeah, you can tell mine's not done because it's still just whipped cream. So there's your butter, and then you've got the buttermilk. Would they actually do something with the buttermilk? Would they make buttermilk biscuits? Or? Yeah, they definitely were always very good at using every part of everything. Nothing went to waste, because yeah. you know obviously there's not a whole lot of resources out there. Mm -hmm. Now, what the kids will do when they come here is they can actually then take the butter, put it on a cracker, mm -hmm. and it's actually really good. Um, so I'm gonna keep that, so that's mine now. <laughs> But it's, again, just another example of one of the, uh, the fun hands-on things that kids can do here. I mean, what, what's the reaction when they finally get butter? I mean, I mean I've never seen kids so excited about butter. <laughs> it's not one of the most thrilling snacks, but when you've made it, it definitely is. And that makes a big difference when people can see the whole process. Yeah. Going back to that other building, one of the really cool things that I remember that when you guys added that was really interesting function is not only do they have the movie, but you guys have this hologram mm -hmm. of Dr. John McLaughlin. And it's, you know, I mean, it's almost like that video that went around a few years ago when like Tupac popped up on the stage at the Music Awards there. I mean, all of a sudden, John McLaughlin walks out and, and talks to you, and it's this really lifelike looking mm -hmm. thing. I mean, that, people that's, well, they don't know if that's coming, it's really going to surprise them. It always is a bit of a surprise, yes. <laughs> 
Once you're done with the movie and, and you hear some of the first-hand tales, what happens in the next film, the final film? Well, with all that lovely Pioneer music still stuck in your brain for the rest of the day, um, you get to go on through into the last exhibit is more about Oregon City and the end of the trail and why we get to say we're the end of the trail, um, which is that land claim office. So when people came here to get free land, um, they had to do the paperwork right here in Oregon City. So all you do is uh, look at a map and choose your square of land. Married couple got 640 acres, um, which an acre is like the size of a football field. So that is quite a bit of land. Um, and all you have to do is sign your name on a deed and promise to stay on it for a certain number of years and do something to it. And that was your fresh start here in Oregon. A little bit easier. So that is a heritage garden. Um, and it's maintained by the master gardeners and they do a lot of research and found all the same kinds of plants that are grown from the seeds the pioneers brought across the trail in their pockets. They couldn't bring a lot of the sentimental items that they didn't really need, but a handful of seeds or a clipping of a rose is something that you can afford to slip into your pocket and bring out and then recreate that garden that you had to leave behind. So we have some of the flowers as well as a vegetable garden out there. Um, and that is also where the plaque that says where the end of the Oregon Trail is located. So that's available 24-7. Okay, we're here at the end of the Oregon Trail. Tell everybody how to get here um, so they can check this all out for themselves. You want to make me give directions? Just all, <laughs> give us the address. You know, we'll, um, we'll Google Map it to get yes. here. So we are located at 1726 Washington Street in Oregon City. It is conveniently located right off of the 205. I'm not sure which exit, but it is easy to find because of these big iconic wagon-like buildings. Um, we really hope that they'll come and visit. Check it out, you're gonna have a great time. I guarantee it, you're gonna learn a lot of stuff. Every time I come here, I learn something new, today included, so I appreciate that. And the kids are gonna come away with a lot of great knowledge and some appreciation of the wonderful heritage we have here in Oregon's Mountain Hood Territory and just how good they have it as well at home. So I encourage everybody to come out here. We've got Memorial Day weekend coming up, an excellent activity for the long weekend. Join us here at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. Look for the big giant covered wagons. And until next time, we'll see you out there in Oregon's Mountain Hood Territory.